Floyd Hurricane of 1913. Um, picked this for one reason. What was it tonight? <laughs> I can't remember. I already researched it. So <laughs> oh, I went for the easy easy slam dunk. Um, it tends to get lost in history, though. There's a lot of people that have never heard of the storm. Um, it happened November 9th to November 11th because it's going to go over four different lakes. There's actually, Lake Ontario is going to be the only lake that does not lose a ship mm -hmm. over this storm. It's going to sink at least one on all of the others. Like any story though, you kind of have to start at the beginning. Forgive me if I jump around lake to lake a little bit because there's a lot of characters to this story and they're not all starting from the same place. So before the storm actually begins, Thursday, November 6th, we're going to start up here in Lake Superior. We're going to start with this guy. Right up here, uh, Port Arthur, Fort William, which on today's map you will find as Thunder Bay, Ontario. We have the James C. Carruthers, and he's up there loading some grain. Now, the unique thing about this boat is he's brand new. This is only his third trip ever. It was just launched in May of 1913. It's the biggest freighter on the Canadian side. Um, and the owners went one step further. Of course, we all know companies like the bottom line. They want the most profit. These owners actually sacrificed cargo space for strength. They went for a safe boat, not a maximum capacity boat. One of its two previous trips had already set a Great Lakes record for hauling flax. So this was the pride of the Canadian fleets. And he's up there loading with this guy, the J.H. Sheetal, also loading green. And the two captains, Captain Wright is in charge of the Carruthers, and we have uh, Captain Lyons on the Sheetal, they're in the office up there in Fort William and they're discussing the weather forecast that's been popping up. They know some weather is, is coming, but nothing that two big newer freighters shouldn't be able to handle. They do plan on traveling down here to Whitefish Point together just in case. So they're loading grain, they're waiting to leave. There's also a third boat up in Fort William, also loading grain, and this is the Wexford. You might notice this guy looks a little bit different than the other two. He was actually built in England. This is an ocean-going freighter. Was, uh, this is what we call a tramp steamer. So he was built really for short runs between England, France, Spain, Ireland, and hauling any types of cargo that he can find. He's not really specified for one trade until it's bought and brought here to the Great Lakes. So what's going to end up happening, they're all going to load with grain here on the 6th. The Wexford is going to end up leaving first. The other two boats are going to follow, and they're going to head right on down here to Whitefish Bay. They're both, all three are heading downbound. When they get to Whitefish Bay, they went through some weather. The storm started to move in, but it was nothing. They really couldn't fight their way through. For a while, Captain Lyons of the Sheetle here, he anchored up in this area for a few hours and then continued on his way. So the Carruthers and the Sheetal got separated. They didn't travel together like they wanted to, but they met up at Whitefish Bay and they ran into some fog and a backlog at the locks. There was 10 to 20 boats waiting their turn to lock through, so they dropped anchor and waited there. Same day, the further the western end of the lake, this guy, Brand new to a brand new fleet, not a new boat. It was built as the RE Shuck. It had just been purchased by a brand new fleet that's still in operation today, the Interlake Steamship Company, and been renamed the Hydrus. He's loading iron ore, and just like our other three boats, he's heading down the lakes. So he's going to go across Lake Superior, and he's going to get caught also in this log jam at Whitefish Bay and wait to lock through. These are the lucky ones. Yes, they went through some weather. Actually, the captain of the Hydras here remarked to a friend when he got to the sea, he said, yeah, it wasn't a very pleasant trip. So it was not an easy trip, but they did make it. And compared to what happens the next day, they're the lucky ones. What's actually happening while these four boats are traveling across the lake, right up here we have a cold front or a low pressure system coming down from Canada. He's going to come across the lake at the same time, there's this smaller system that's going to merge right at the top of Lake Michigan. <laughs> and then those storms are going to head southeast over Lake Huron. 
If you've ever watched the movie Perfect Storm, it's the same type of thing. You have two storm fronts merging to make one big storm, and they're starting to merge, they're starting to kick up some severe weather while those first four boats are arriving at Whitefish Bay. The ones who aren't as lucky are the ones who left the next day. At Two Harbors, Minnesota, we have the L.C. Waldo. Shameless plug for the museum here. If you look right over there to your right, you'll see a model of that boat. He's going to load with iron ore at Two Harbors. He's going to leave the next morning. And when he leaves, he's going to have some northerly winds, some waves. It's not going to be too big of a deal. He's going to get up about here, and by now that low pressure system has gone way down over here, so these counterclockwise winds are starting to curl back around, and Captain Donaldson finds himself in 60 mile an hour winds with about 20 foot seas, straight on his stern. They're going right over the back of his boat, rolling up the deck, and he's having a hard time of it, but he's doing okay so far, and then he gets out about here, it's night, it's now turned into a blizzard, and he hears a roar coming from behind his ship. Now in these days, if you look right up here, this is where they actually navigated from. There was a wheelsman down here where it was protected, but the guys actually navigating were up here in all the snow and wind and cold. I'm sure they didn't like that setup very much. But, so he's outside, he can hear one large wave coming. And what happens sometimes is you get waves will actually sink up. So two or three waves will get all synced up and you have this one wave that will be significantly larger than the others. And it rolls right over the stern, up the deck, and this whole forward deck house area gets smashed off of the wall though. So Captain Duddleson, his first mate, and his wheelsman only survived because at the last minute they dove down the stairway that led downstairs to the captain's cabin. So right on their heels, they're diving down the ladder. The whole deck house is being ripped right off of this boat. They go back up there, the steering wheel's gone, the compass is gone, and they're in the middle of a storm. So Donaldson, what he does, he sends his first mate back to the lifeboat, so he now has to go all the way down to this open deck in this type of weather. He's going to send his mate for a handheld compass from one of the lifeboats and a lantern. And there is a backup steering wheel for the wheelsman. So now he's out in the open elements on a damaged boat using a lantern and a handheld compass to navigate in Lake Superior in a gale. Mm. Not where you want to be. And now he's going to change his course. He's not worried about getting to the Sioux. He's going to try to get right back in here underneath the Keweenaw Peninsula, get out of the wind and wait for better weather. And he almost makes it. He's just about to round the tip of the peninsula when another wave rips the rudder off the ship and now he can't steer. And the waves are actually gonna crash him into Gull Island right here at the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula, bow first, and that's where he's gonna stay for several days. It's not pleasant, he goes in bow first. The ship actually cracks in half. The entire crew has to go to the bow section because the stern could slip off and sink in deep water. So they get everyone out, they rush up to the forward. Uh, they're gonna sit right up in here. There's some rooms up there they're gonna hide in. But when they left, no one thought to grab much food out of the galley. So they're going to be huddled up in here in this cold, heaterless steel ship with two cans of tomatoes. That's all they've got. And for, I think it's about 28 people. And they're going to be there for days. That's where he's going to stay. And of course, up there, if you've ever been up there, it's not the most populated area. Who knows when they might be found. There's another ship on the 7th that's going to head out into Lake Superior, and this is the Lee Field. You might notice he looks a lot like the Wexford, pretty much a sister ship. He's going to leave the Algoma Dock right here in the Sioux with a cargo that's not heard of in today's world, but was really common in 1913. He's loaded with railroad rails. At this point, Canada is building their transcontinental railroads. They're, they're spread, it's branching out everywhere and they're getting those rails via ship. So he's loaded with steel rails. And he's gonna head up into Lake Superior, heading for where our other guys were leaving. He's going to Fort William area. But he's not gonna make it. 
we don't know exactly what happens to the leaf field. One report, one passing steamer says they think they saw him aground on Angus Island. But later searches never found any trace of the leaf field. It could be history repeating itself. A few years prior, its sister ship, the Monkshaven, also went aground on Angus Island. Same island, same style ship, just a few years apart. But again, we don't know. It may have been a different ship that was aground there. No one ever found any trace from the leaf field. So things are getting bad on Lake Superior, and they're only going to get worse. Same day, Friday, November 7th, we need to shift down here to Lake Erie. We have this guy, the Argus. Sister ship to the Hydras, also just recently purchased by the Interlake Steamship Company and renamed the Argus. This used to be the Lewis Woodruff. Under its new name, he's loading coal in Buffalo. Now the thing about storms on the Great Lakes, they typically last three, four days, and captains knew this. So what, the, what Captain Gutsch is saying is if I leave Buffalo now, by the time he's heading upbound, he's going to go around, he's heading to Milwaukee, he says, by the time I get up there, that storm's going to be dying out, so I really don't need to wait. It's going to take me a couple days to get there anyway, so I can go ahead and leave. He's going to head off, heading for the St. Clair River and later on Port Huron. The next day, there's more traffic on the lower lakes. This little guy, the Regina, is also built in England. And he's loading at Sombra, Ontario. The best way I've ever heard this ship described is as a floating UPS truck. <laughs> he is loading everything that's going to be needed by the logging camps in the Georgian Bay area for the rest of the winter. He's on the last run before the Georgian Bay freeze is over. He's loaded with bales of hay for the horses. He's got horseshoes, bottles of whiskey, some champagne for New Year's Eve anything these loggers are going to need to get through the winter because there are no railroad, railways there yet. What he brings is what they have to make it through to about April. So he's loading everything that's going to be needed. In Sandusky, Ohio, the Johnny McGeehan is loading coal. The Isaac M. Scott and the Charles S. Price are in Cleveland also loading coal. And they're going to say the same thing as the captain of the Argus. I can leave now. I know there's a storm up there on the northern lakes, but it'll be dying out by the time I get there. So they're all leaving. And the Argus is going to be coming across the lake as well. They're all going to get up here around Port Huron area, and then they're going to have to make a decision. <clears throat> Meanwhile, on the other side of the mitten, on Lake Michigan, we have this little guy, the Louisiana. Yes, in 1913, there were still some wooden ships around. It's a wooden steamer called the Louisiana. Sources tell me two different things. He's either heading to Escanaba or he was heading to Alpina. I have not been able to figure out exactly which one is true. One author I read said he was going to Escanaba first and then to Alpina. So either he found a source I can't, or he just combined the two and called it good. But at any rate, He's chugging along up Lake Michigan, some waves, nothing that he really can't handle. And he gets up this way, and all of a sudden the wind completely dies. Zero wind. And the guys on the boat started looking at each other going, we're in trouble. Wind just doesn't die. What they wound up being is right in the center where those two storm fronts I showed you merged. They're right in the eye of the storm. And about 20 minutes later, the winds had shifted from the south to the north at 55 miles an hour. It came crashing down on them. And the poor little Louisiana is chugging along at full speed ahead and going straight backwards. He can't even go forward into what he just got hit with. And eventually, he's going to go aground right here on Washington Island. Kind of a funny story. They're aground, everyone's safe. They put a couple guys over the side to go get help. And the, the mate that went with them was the smallest guy on the crew. And by this point, there was some snow on the island, some big drifts. And he said that the guys used him to break the snow drift so they could walk through. They said they'd pick him up, throw him into a snow bank, and follow after him. So either he's a really good storyteller, or he had the worst walk in history. 
While they're going to go get help, the Louisiana catches fire. And the rest of the crew has to go over the side and get on the island. Fortunately, no one was lost, but the ship burned to the waterline in the same area. We have the Plymouth. Very interesting boat. It was actually built as a steamer, as a wooden steamship. Later in life, he was, the engine was taken out. It was rebuilt as a schooner. And then after that, a few years, the ma these masts wound up being cut down and it was turned into a barge to be towed by a tugboat like the James H. Martin. And they're going across Green Bay when this storm hit on Lake Michigan. They're heading for a load of lumber. There's seven men aboard the Plymouth. They're not all sailors. The Plymouth is actually in a legal dispute. So a man named Chris Keenan is on board. He's a U.S. Deputy Marshal. He's simply there to make sure that no mischief happens to the boat. Okay? He has no idea about how to run a sailing vessel. He has no idea about what typically happens to a barge that's being towed in a storm. What's going to happen is after the storm hits, the poor little uh, Martin here was not in the best of shape. It starts to leak. So the captain decides the only thing he has he can do is to cut the towing hawser and run for safety. Now this was that might seem really cruel, but that's normal in 1913. And the guys running the barge knew this. So Captain McKinnon of the Martin, he's going to cut the towing hawser, expecting the Plymouth to drop its anchor. He got him behind an island, behind St. Martin's Island here. And they're going to drop the anchor, and he's going to go running for some harbor where he can pump out the water that's coming into his boat. Think about Chris Keenan for a second. He's not a sailor. He doesn't understand this. He's on a barge in a storm and his tugboat just cutting loose. That's going to come back in the story when this is all over. When it is over, the Martin's going to go back looking for the Plymouth and it's not going to be there. They're not going to find anything from the Plymouth when it's all done. That's kind of the preliminary story. For us here on the east side of the state, Lake Huron is where this story really blows up. Because one thing starts to happen. I said those captains in the lower lakes, they left expecting the storm to die out. Well, they weren't wrong. It did start to die out. So they left. On Sunday, November 9th, they notice the conditions starting to get better. The storm is starting to ease. So all these vessels that I just told you about, the Wexford is going to come down. All those boats that were in Whitefish Bay waiting to walk through, they're going to take advantage of this weather and they're going to head down to their ports where they're headed. The Wexford, the Carruthers, the Sheetal, also the Hydras. They think they're making the right call. And under normal circumstances, they would be. So Lake Huron is suddenly getting a lot of traffic that was waiting for the storm to ease. In about 24 hours, not even, not even 24 hours, all these vessels that I have right here on this map, the J.H. Sheetal is going to be the only one that's still floating by midnight. They're all going to be lost. Mother Nature can be cruel. This is what we call a sucker hole. The storm looks like it's easy and like it should. These guys took the bait and they left. Normally, a, a reasonable decision for a captain to make, except what they don't realize. It's not just this storm that they knew about. There's another low pressure system that formed over the Appalachian Mountains. So this front here that's now two storms merged into one is going to be coming across Lake Huron and it's going to merge with a third front. And this honestly caught everyone by surprise because low pressure systems from this direction don't go here. They go out over the Atlantic Ocean. This went backwards. So know what the, the forecasters, everyone got caught off guard. So, they merge over Canada right here. 
So in a low pressure system, these, the winds go counterclockwise. So all of these ships that I had going up the lake, when they left, they had light southerly winds, decent seas. In a few hours, they're going to be getting blasted by 70 mile an hour winds and waves. Because the waves had a chance to go the whole length, we call this the fetch, they go the whole length of the lake, they have a chance a couple hundred miles to build up. And these ships are going to be getting hit by waves that are going to touch 35 feet. And sustained winds of 70 miles an hour, gust clocked at upwards of 90. That's a category one hurricane. Alpina had a weather station to monitor all this, and the anemometer at the top that was designed to measure wind speeds got ripped off the roof. I read that actually in their logs, anemometer, gone, capital letters, underlined, gone. No idea what the wind speed is. Last record, 75. They were done. This is what these guys sailed out into. There's one more captain that got caught by that sucker hole. And he's up on Lake Superior, this guy, the Henry B. Smith. Captain Jimmy Owen had had a bad season. The story goes, and there's, you know, everyone wants to say whether it's true or not. The story at the time goes, Captain Owens had had a bad season. Bad luck had followed him all year. He'd been late all season long. Breakdowns at the dock, bad weather, everything, every trip, he had been late all year. And the company told him, on this last trip, you bring your cargo in on time or you will be looking for a new job. Jimmy Owen doesn't want to lose his boat. He's been on the Smith since she was brand new. He's the only captain that's ever been on her. He is proud of his boat and he does not want to lose her. He's in Marquette loading ore. He begs the dock workers to come back and finish loading his boat on a Sunday. They typically didn't do that. But all these guys, they knew Jimmy Owen, they knew what he was up against, so they offered to come do this on a Sunday to get him on his way. He's in a little bit of a hurry. There's another boat that's anchored in Marquette Harbor waiting to load called the Choctaw, and Captain Fox watches as the Smith leaves, and he notices something. His crew is still battening the hatches down. He's going out into the storm and he doesn't have his hatches battened down. Captain Jimmy Owen, his last words, theoretically, as they say, he told the guys in the dock, why are the owners on coming? And he's going to leave Marquette and he's heading for the sea. All he's got to do is go right along the shore, get behind Whitefish Point, he should be okay. The storm is easing, he's going to motor on his way while he has his chance. Captain Fox watches him leave with his crew furiously trying to put the hatch clamps on. The Smith gets out here, and Captain Fox and the Choctaw can still see him, and the storm picks back up. And he watches the Smith do something he didn't expect. He turns north. He should have gone east to get to the Sioux. About a mile out of Marquette, Captain Jimmy Owen realized, I goofed. So he's going to go, he's going to try to get under the uh, Keweenaw Peninsula for some shelter. He's going to go this way. And when the storm, the blizzard closes in, that's the last anyone sees of the Smith. Captain Fox is going to be the last man to see that boat on the surface. I'm going to jump back to Lake Erie. One more wreck to tell you about. This little guy, Lightship 82. Back in the day, the government built lightships where it wasn't reasonable or economical to build a lighthouse. So Lightship 82 was a relatively new boat. It was launched in Muskegon in 1911. Anchored off Point Abino, Ontario, just on the American side of the lake to help guide ships into Buffalo. A couple days later, the Champlain's coming down and the mate realizes he can't see this big lake here at the top of the mast where he should. So he calls his brother, the captain, up and they both start looking. They can't see the light ship. And his first hope was, maybe he pulled up anchor and got out of the storm. But that's not what these boats were for. They didn't do that. During bad weather is exactly when they had to be where they were supposed to be. So they had a bad feeling. When they got into Buffalo, they reported it missing. 
the next May in 1914, they found the buffalo two miles off its position. It drug its anchors two miles. And that's not normal for a light ship. They sit in all kinds of weather. They make it through all sorts of storms. And they don't move. This one got moved two miles. There's what it looked like when they found it. They did wind up in 1950 and they salvaged the hull. They brought it up, fixed it up, and put it back into service. All those boats I told you about only here on, they got caught when those storms merged. We don't know exactly what happened. There were no survivors from any of those boats to tell us. But we can get reasonably close. Because this guy, the Sheetle that I told you was loading with the Carruthers in Fort William, he did survive. And when it was over, the captain wrote a letter to his front office detailing what he experienced. You need to read it. I can't do it justice because that whole letter reads like an adventure novel. As they're coming down the lake, they're taking these huge waves right over the, st right over the stern. And as they get further down the lake, the waves get bigger and bigger because they've got more lake space to build up. It smashes in windows and doors. It takes all the food out of the pantry and the galley. It smashes dishes. It actually breaks the skylights over the engine room. The poor engineer spent a day and a half with his hand on the throttle down in the engine room, working it back and forth. Because when the propeller would come out of the water and these waves would spin too fast, if they let it go, it would damage the engine. So these poor guys, there were two of them, they took turns, but for a day and a half they stood there throttling the motor back and running it back up when the propeller went back in the water. They were getting waves crashing down on their heads inside the engine room. The other crew actually had to rig a canvas over their head. Basically, they put a tent up over the engineers to keep the waves off of their heads while they worked the throttles. Four to six feet of water in the cabins, inside the boat. Four to six feet. He's talking about the waves, or the winds, 70 miles an hour straight out of the north. And the one thing, he, every captain afterwards said, the way the winds hit like that, it didn't slowly build up. So the waves came closer together than they were used to, and it just pummeled these boats. I love this. You normally think about guys closing doors to keep water out of their vessel. He's got an oiler in the dining room watching. And when a wave comes over the stern, he shuts the door. And then when the wave's gone, he opens the door to let water out of the boat. It's his job to stand there and let water come back out of the cabins. So, you know, that's not a good spot to be. He gets to the bottom of the lake. He has to do what nobody wants to do. He's got to turn around. He's reached the bottom of the lake here on. He knows it. He can't see. It's a blizzard. He's got 35-foot seas. He can't get into the St. Clair River. He's going to turn around in this and it almost throws him off the boat. He's up in that upper pilot house. And you can see right here he talks about they're hanging on to stanchions with their legs parallel to the deck the boat was rolling so far. That's amazing enough that he pulled it off. Captain Lyons did it three times that day. And he lived to tell it. He's about the only one who did. You have another good idea of what these boats went through. This is the Howard M. Hanna Jr. He was upbound on Lake Huron that day. He walked out. He was only pushed ashore. Right off Point Off Barks at the tip of Michigan's thumb, he's going to go on the reef right here. And you can see what the waves did. You can see the uh, funnel, the smokestack is gone, the hatch covers are gone. You can see this little crack right here, the boat is split in two. Fortunately, they got everyone off this. The whole crew survived. But again, waste deep water in the cabins. There was a, a lady cook that worked for a whole day up to her waist in ice water to keep hot coffee on the stove to get to the crew while they were waiting to be rescued by the life saving service. And they eventually came and got everybody off. So between Captain Lyon's letter and these pictures, we can get a reasonable feel for what the boats that didn't make it experienced. 
it didn't take long for the newspapers to figure out this was not going to be good. Storms are normal in November on the Great Lakes, but not like this. It took a couple days for news to filter in. Telegraph, telegraph wires were down. Cleveland was buried. They are actually worried about a famine in Cleveland. They couldn't get food in. They had restricted milk simply to newborns and the hospitals. So they weren't sure when more shipments were coming in. Trains got stuck on the rails. They couldn't get through snowdrifts. They were so big. So it took a couple days for news to start coming in. But this number from the Detroit News is not wrong. After a day or two, all up and down the Canadian shoreline here, people are going to find wreckage and bodies. They're going to come, they're going to come ashore one at a time, two at a time, in lifeboats, on life rafts. There's going to be wreckage of cabins. There's going to be life belts. All sorts of debris is going to come ashore. Godrich, Point Clark. Right here, where the red arrow is, three guys from the Johnny McGeehan were found tied to this life raft. Most of these people didn't drown, they froze. They were tied to the life raft, and they were found frozen. One guy from the McGeehan floated all the way back to the St. Clair River, where that trip into Lake Huron started. And he was actually found in the river. They came, they came ashore in lifeboats. They did manage to abandon ship in those conditions. They came ashore in the Regina's lifeboat, the Hydrus's lifeboat, and they were found also frozen. There's other stories that come ashore. It's not just the wreckage. Back in those days, ships carried a metal canister that they could seal. And they could put notes and a crew roster in and throw it overboard and hopefully it would wash ashore and be found. And people would know what happened. Remember that Chris Keenan I told you about on the Plymouth? The guy that was the U.S. Deputy Marshal? He wrote, he had this, he wrote this note. It's a dear wife and children, we were left up here in Lake Michigan by McKinnon, captain of the tug James H. Martin. He went away and never said goodbye or anything. Remember, this guy's not a sailor. He's standing there watching the tugboat leave him in the middle of the storm. And he has no idea why. We lost one man yesterday. Been in the storm 40 hours. This is a wooden schooner of ours that's been pounded for 40 hours. So goodbye, dear ones. I might see you in heaven. Pray for me. And there was some question. It wasn't Chris Keenan's handwriting. Is it a hoax? Then in his handwriting at the bottom, there was a PS. So I felt so bad. It's probably so seasick, I can't write. I had one of the other guys write for me. He says, goodbye forever. And then he had an extra PS at the end. He said, by the way, my boss still owes me $35. Make sure that gets sent home. So he at least didn't forget about what he was owed. There's a door from that Lightship 82 that disappeared, came ashore. So the message I said, goodbye, Nellie. Your ship is breaking up fast. Williams. Williams was the captain of the late ship. Again, people said, it's got to be a hoax. His wife's name was Amanda. Who's Nellie? They asked her. He never called me Nellie. Their friends had agreed. Never heard him call his wife Nellie. Amanda got to see the door. She said, yes, that's his writing. I found this story in the Cleveland Plain Dealer when I was researching this. When the Argus went down, they created an orphan. A 14-year-old girl named Marjorie, her stepfather was the steward on the Argus, so he's the head cook. And at the end of the season, he found himself needing help. So he asked his wife to come be his assistant for one trip. And she had done this in the, in the past, apparently. So they left Marjorie at a boarding house, and she went with him for this last trip to, to help him out. And they were both lost when the Argus went down. When, she, her, when her body is found inside of a lifeboat, there was some old school chivalry going on, and she was found in the chief engineer's overcoat and the captain's life jacket. They tried to get her home. 
but no one made it home from the Argus. There were survivors, believe it or not. These guys, this is pre-Coast Guard days. This is the days of the U.S. Life Saving Service. These are tough guys. If you've ever seen the movie The Finest Hours, this is what we're talking about. So they would, in 1913, they had some motorboats like this, and if they knew of a ship that was in trouble, they were going to go get these guys. And they intended to do it. They had a great motto. Regulations say we have to go out. They don't say anything about coming back. And they would go out. There are stories of these guys going out and having to be chipped out of their lifeboat when they got back. They were frozen into their boat. People would have to come in with axes and picks and chip them out of the ice. When they said, when they said this motto, they meant it. November 10th, after all these ships have sunk, but before the world really knows about it, remember I told you about the wall though up at, up at the Keweenaw? He's going to be found. Captain Mosher on the George Stevenson sees this wreck. He gets as close as he can. He's hoping for some sign of life, but he's not hopeful. And then at the last second before he's about to give up, someone runs a flag up the mast. And he knows there's somebody still alive. So he brings the uh, Stevenson in here to Lake LaBelle, and he puts his mate over in a lifeboat who rows ashore, and he calls to Eagle Harbor Life Saving Station. He says, there's a, there's a boat. You've got to go get these guys. Someone's still alive. Eagle Harbor's lifeboat had been smashed in the storm. The boathouse had been destroyed. The lifeboat had been smashed. They're still trying to fix it. But they don't know this. The mate goes back to the Stevenson. The Stevenson goes back over here to where the Waldo is just to stay and watch. Just to make sure. He's going to wait until help shows up. And after a while, no help is showing up. So Captain Mosher goes back over in here. The mate rows ashore in a lifeboat again. And this time he's going to call the Portage Canal Life Saving Station. Their lifeboat is working. So they're going to go this way. They're going to try to go this way and around. And they're going to get beaten. They can't make any headway in that storm that's still running in their motor lifeboat. That doesn't sit well with the lifesavers. They take this personally. So the captain of the Portage Canal Station says, fine, we're going to put this lifeboat on a rail car, and we're going to go up to Lake LaBelle. Meanwhile, Eagle Harbor has gotten their boat fixed, and they're taking off. So when the Portage Canal guys get to Lake LaBelle, they put their boat in the water, they take off, believe it or not. Neither crew knew the other one was responding. They had no idea. And they both arrived at the Waldo at the same time. And they both showed up and what are you doing here? But it was, it was good they had two boats because there was about 28 people to get off of the Waldo. When they got there, that's what they found completely frozen over in ice. You can't really see it in this picture, but it is cracked in half right about here. They got everybody off. They actually had to go aboard with axes and chip the people out because the, the doors to where they were hiding were covered with a foot of ice. They had to go chip them out. And they got them in the lifeboat, put some in each lifeboat, and got them ashore. For this rescue, Everyone got the gold life-saving medal from both crews. By the way, this is hanging up right over there. Another shameless plug for our museum. We have that lighthouse. We have that medal. Okay? The life-saving service only ever had two dual awards of the life-saving medal. And this is one of them. In their entire existence, they only ever awarded it to two stations for one rescue twice. And these guys got one of them. There's another incredible story. Still dealing with the lifesavers. At Port Huron, their station was also smashed. The boathouse was completely demolished. The lifeboat is buried in the sand and full of holes. And the captain looks out and he sees something. He's not sure what. At first he thinks it might be a schooner with a mast blown over. Then he's thinking, well, maybe it's one of those whaleback ships. I'm not sure. But his boat is buried in the beach. He can't get it out. So he calls Captain Reed of Port Huron and says, there's something off my station, and I think it might be a boat in distress or at least needing assistance. Could you go take a look at it? Captain Reed says, sure. That's what he finds. 
This stunned people. This is a 500 foot ore carrier upside down. And no one expected that that could happen. These were the biggest to be built at that time, and people really thought they were the wave of the future. These were the safest that could be built. And to see one floating upside down kind of shocked people. They had no idea who it was. It floated like this for a week, just north of Port Huron. And there was all sorts of speculation. Who is it? Because by now, the reports are rolling in. The Hydrus is overdue. The Argus is overdue. The price is overdue. Who is this? You have people waiting ashore to find out what happened to their family member. What boat is this? The media has always been good at the speculation game. It was no different in 1913. Maybe people said it was the Carruthers. People said it was the Wexford. Some people said it was the Regina, which I love because the owners of the Regina said, no, 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 it's not our boat. The bottom pane on our boat is green. That's black. It's not our boat. And there were people that told them they were wrong. <laughs> they owned the boat. I think they would know, but they're, no, no, it could still be the Regina. Okay, whatever. It took a week before the lake calmed down enough to put a diver down and read the name. Finally, they get a diver down on November 15th. He goes down in his hard hat suit. He's feeling around. He can only see a couple feet. He's actually tracing the upside down letters with his fingers. And he goes over it twice to get the name. And he comes back up to the tug. And there's news reporters on the tug. Who is it? What boat is it? What did you see? He says, no, nah, not until I get paid. So he doesn't tell them until the tug gets back to Port Huron and the reporters pay him what they promised and then he tells them it's the price. Fully loaded with coal. Got rolled turtle. There were other survivors. Speaking of the price, Milton Smith is the third assistant engineer. When they're loading coal in Cleveland, he leaves. He has one more trip to make for the season, and he's leaving. His chief engineer, his captain, his friends all said, what are you doing? One more trip, one more week of work, you're going to get your end of the year bonus? Don't go. He says, no, I've had enough for the year. I'm done. I'm going to go home. He tries to talk his, uh, his friend Ars McIntosh, the wheels, and says, come with me. So it's been a long year. Why don't you come home with me? They're both from the Port Huron area. And Ars says, no. I, doctor says I need to have an operation on my eyes. I need that end of the year bonus. I, I gotta stay, but I wish I could go with you. The price never finishes that last trip. Had he listened to his friends, had he listened to his captain and his chief engineer, he would have been inside that boat floating upside down too. The mate on the Smith up in Marquette has a rare, unique opportunity. He can be thankful that he got sick. He had pneumonia. He wound up leaving the ship, getting on a train, and going home. And the Smith never made it out of Marquette very far. My favorite story from the whole storm. John Thompson from the James C. Carruthers. His sister's reading the newspaper, and she sees a headline that says the Carruthers is lost. And she knows her brother John is on it. <laughs> so she wires her father and says, John is drowned, come at once. So the dad shows up, he goes to Godrich, and he's going through the makeshift morgue, and he finds his son. Pretty easy to spot. He has JT tattooed on his forearm. He has a condition which causes a couple of his toes to crisscross, and he's missing certain teeth. The only thing was the hair was the wrong color. The dad said, hey, man, his hair's not the right color. And the coroner said, uh, you know, that happens when a body's been in the water for a long time. And you can't really argue with a tattoo and missing teeth, right? I mean, this is his son. So he takes the body home. He buys a burial plot. He buys a casket. They're having a wake in the living room. And there's a knock on the door. The mother goes and opens the door and passes out. She faints right there in the doorway. So dad walks over to see what's going on. And there stands his son. And being the good, loving father that he is, the first thing he does, get out of my house. <laughs> he kicks him out of the house. Glad you're alive. Go away. Said, I just spent all this money. Your mother's passed out on the floor. The guests are going, what? Go, just leave till I can get rid of the chaos. 
Turns out, John Thompson had switched boats, never told his family. He read about his death in the Toronto newspaper. And being the 20-something-year-old smart guy that he was, decided, I'm not going to send a telegram, I'll just go home. They'll find out I didn't die when I get home. And they've, he, he walks in on his own wake. They never figured out where the other body was. There were five bodies never, never identified, and they're buried in Godrich in an unknown grave that's just Mark Sailors. But the same tattoo, the same missing teeth, the same condition with his toes, the same height. And he was never identified. With the price upside down, people wonder how that could happen. There's another fun story from the, from the Morgan Godrich. Milton Smith is called in to identify his shipmates. And he's going down the line, oh yeah, there's ours. There's the cook. Oh, that, that's John Groundwater. That's my chief engineer. And the coroner says, are you sure? He goes, yeah, I worked on this guy for all summer, or all year. I know, I know John. He goes, well, why did he come ashore wearing a Regina life belt? I don't know. So he theorized that possibly the two ships collided and guys were just throwing life jackets to whoever they could and they got mixed up. Led to a great idea, especially with the price floating upside down, they thought the Regina might be underneath it. But when William Baker dove down there, he came back and said, no, there's no ship underneath that thing. A couple days later, we realized what was going on. Human nature's not always the greatest. People were looting the bodies as they came ashore. Their pockets were turned out. Things were missing. People were taking the life jackets for souvenirs until the Canadian government threatened to prosecute. And then people were just throwing things back at whatever body they could find. So probably some looter put the Regina life jacket on a sailor from the price. But it led to some really interesting speculation for quite a while. There's always the blame game. Who is to blame? The sailors all, all blame the weatherman. You didn't tell us this was coming. The weatherman said, oh yeah, we did. We had storm signals up at 112 points around the Great Lakes. Don't tell us you didn't know. And the captains all said, you told us a storm was coming. You didn't tell us a hurricane was coming. And the weatherman said, according to the Weather Bureau manual, the only thing that qualifies as a hurricane occurs in the tropical zone. According to their regulations, they were not allowed to fly the hurricane signal on the Great Lakes because a hurricane only exists in the tropical climate zone. All the criteria were there. The wind speeds were high enough. But according to the manual, it couldn't be a hurricane, so they just said a storm was coming. So they said, you guys sailed right past 112 warnings. Don't tell us. We didn't tell you. And the captain said, well, you just told us a storm was coming, not a hurricane. So there was a little bit of bickering back and forth. Basically, it comes down to this was a storm that exceeded the normal. No one really could forecast how severe this was going to get. You can see on this map all the black uh, logos here. These are the ships that are sunk. The gray ones are ones that are pushed to ground. And you can see, like I said earlier, Lake Ontario, the only lake that's not going to lose at least one ship. Storms typically hit one lake, maybe two, not four. And they don't get stronger as they go on day after day. The Lake Carriers Association had this to say about it. Ironically, before this storm, 1913 had been one of the safest years in sailing for a decade. They had lost fewer sailors. 1913 sailing, there were losses every year. But 1913 had been one of the safest on record for close to a decade until one storm. And they even said no lake master could ever remember anything like that happening before. Storms usually last four to five hours when they're getting up to that 60, 70 mile an hour range. This one, 16 hours. The winds blew that hard. Over the years, the wrecks have been found. The story is still being told. Didn't take long to find the price. It was floating upside down after this storm. The next year they found Lightship 82. 
And then no one was found until 1972. When the Argus was found upside down off the tip of Michigan's thumb. Upside down, like many other. There are actually, there are some news articles. We think there may have been three other vessels sighted floating upside down after the storm. But then at, when people went looking for them, they had already sunk. But there may have been up to three other boats floating out in the lake upside down when this was over. Four years later, the Scots going to be found right off of Alpena. 1985, the McGeehan and the Regina are both going to be found. And then you have to fast forward all the way to 2000. And the Wexford showed up by a fisherman. His downriggers got caught in it. Most of these wrecks actually get found by accident. The Regina was found by a sheriff's boat looking for a sunken tugboat. They usually get found by people looking for something totally different. The Henry D. Smith showed up two months before the 100th anniversary of its sinking. In August of 2013, they found it. The Smith was a hot topic. Everyone wanted to find it. Actually, the U.S. Navy used it as a training tool during the Cold War. They, the U.S. Navy went looking for the Smith to test their sub-hunting equipment during the Cold War, thinking, hey, this equipment is supposed to find Russian subs trying to hide. We should probably be able to find a steel freighter full of iron ore. They couldn't do it. I hope they found the subs. They couldn't find the Smith until 2013. And that was not the Navy, by the way. That was some private. Uh, shipwreck hunters. Okay. The Plymouth? We don't know. No one's found it that we know of. There are some rumors that possibly it has been found, but nothing definitive. The Lee Field is still missing. And even the giant James C. Carruthers, 106 years later, the biggest one on the Canadian side of the lakes at that time has not been found. Now, two years ago, I was talking to a guy that's on uh, one of the premier shipwreck hunting teams on the Great Lakes. He was telling me they thought they'd found it. They're actively looking for this. He said, we had a hit on our sonar. It was the right length. It was in the right spot. We were all excited. We jumped in the lake. We went down to go check it out. We found a big limestone shelf. Mm. There wasn't even a wreck down there. So the Carruthers is still missing. More of the story to come when somebody finds one. Here's the final toll. We don't know too much about the Wexford. We do know that it was carrying a couple passengers, so its roster is a little shady. There's some debate as to which storm was the worst. Some people say the 1905 storm in Lake Superior. Some people say the 1940 storm on Lake Michigan. It actually had higher winds. That storm hit over 100 miles an hour. But the great storm of 1913, losses on four lakes, and over 250 sailors lost. No other storm has come close to that level of damage or loss ever. Hopefully you learned something. <laughs> Everybody wound up with the black and the gray so that we can